from the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. Okay, we're going. Uh, today is Tuesday, May 31, 2011. My name is Joe Monier of the Southern Oral History Program at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, I'm with uh, filmmaker John Bishop in Selma, Alabama where we are recording an oral history interview for the Civil Rights History Project, which is an undertaking of the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. We're especially happy to be here today with you, Miss Avery. We're in Selma, as I mentioned, with Miss Ann Pearl Avery to talk about your life and work and engagement with SNCC and all your efforts in the struggle. Thank you for welcoming us to Selma, and we're really pleased to be with you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm pleased to meet you. <laughs> um, let, me, let me start this morning just to have you talk a little bit about um, where you were born and where you came up, a little bit about your family. Um, well, uh, what, um, I was born in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, and um, my mother and father, uh, Will and Hattie Townsend, I was the first baby, and my father was 50, 50, 54 years old when I was born. I was the first baby. <laughs> but um, anyway, um, <clears throat> we were, um, I, I say we were, we were poor. I'm poor now, but we were poor then. <laughs> but um, anyway, as time went on, I, uh, in in Birmingham, I had um, this situation where my my aunt, by the name of Hattie, Aunt Hattie up in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, had a um, uh, she and her husband didn't have any children. The husband deceased, and. Um, she wanted somebody to come stay with her. And my mother had four of us, so my mother decided to share me with her for a few years. And that was your great aunt, actually. That was my great aunt. That's, that was my, my mother's aunt, which would have been my great aunt. And during that time I was in Pittsburgh, I went to Gladstone Elementary, lived in Hazelwood. Um, lived on Sylvan, I think it was Sylvan Road, or Sylvan Avenue. It was Sylvan Avenue, I'm sure that this is. But anyway, during that time, Emmett <coughs> Till was murdered. And I guess you can say for a child, I was only about nine or 10 years old when he was murdered, but the adults were in, uh, you know, talking about it in the community and talking about it uh, at, my, uh, at my home there because my Aunt Hattie had, had boarders. And um, they were talking about it and the way they were talking about it, they were just talking about a child. Only thing I could understand, get out of it, was a child had been murdered, um, a Negro child, and I that's I think that's what kind of piqued my interest. Uh, although I didn't understand lynching or anything, but I did understand that a child was murdered, and I was a child, and I was curious about this uh, the child being murdered. And I looked for a newspaper around the house. Usually the newspaper would be there because she had a board and stuff. They bring newspaper. But I was head for the comics. And uh, there was no newspaper that day. So I decided to um, <coughs> go down to the uh, little neighborhood grocery store where they had a, had a news uh, rack there, newspaper rack. And I wanted to um, take a look at the paper. And I was fumbling with the paper, and the, the uh, 
a t um, store attendant told me that I couldn't um, handle a paper unless I paid for it. But fortunately, by me being the only child member in the family, period, cousins, and I had some cousins there, but they were adults, they spoiled me. They made sure I had pocket money to go to the movie. They made sure I had money to buy cookies and candy, uh, bubble gum, whatever I wanted to do, you know. Put it. So the, I paid for the paper. Uh, and when I see it now, <laughs> I, in a humorous type of way, I said, well, I sacrificed a nickel. <laughs> and I can't remember which paper it was, whether it was the Pittsburgh, the regular paper, everyday paper there, with a, I'm not sure whether it was the Pittsburgh Curry or uh, Pittsburgh Cosette or something like that. It could have been, I'm not sure. You know. But anyway, I tried to read this paper to try to understand the death of uh, Emmett Till, but I still couldn't understand it really because I'm trying to understand it from a nine or 10 year old point of view. The only thing I understood that it was a child murder and it was um, a black child murder. Um, later on, I'm back in Birmingham and a man was murdered by the name of Mac Parker Poplarville, Mississippi. But I'm 14 years old now. And what happened is they had arrested him. Uh, basically the same type of thing that Emmett Till was uh, murdered for, uh, making insulting remarks to a white female or something like that. And they arrested him, kept him in jail for a couple of weeks and there were threats to take him out of jail, and I was keeping up with that too. And then, all of a sudden, they went in and took him out of jail and killed him. And um, right after that, there a lot of other things began to happen. The bus boycott in Montgomery, um, authoring Lucy trying to enter the, enter the University of Ole Miss. Reverend Shuttlesworth right there in Birmingham uh, along with uh, Reverend Billups and Reverend Oliver and Reverend Pfeiffer. Uh, these are the ministers that I remember um, that uh, were trying to desegregate the schools there in Birmingham. Matter of fact, specifically, I think he was trying to desegregate Phillips High, which my children graduated, both of my boys graduated from. But anyway, <clears throat> these things went on, and then after that came the sit-ins and the Freedom Rides. And I was really excited at that point, but I'm 16 years old now, so I understand this from a different level. And <clears throat> on the news, I was hearing about young people being involved and young people uh, wanting to change, and I was young and I wanted to get involved. So um, what I did is I said I wanted to go with them. I wanted to get involved, I wanted to go with them. And I didn't know whether they were going to come to Birmingham or what. You were speaking of the Freedom Riders. Mm -hmm. yep. I'm speaking of the Freedom Riders. And when they got to, um, when they get they, they, in Atlanta, I think, and they said they were coming to Birmingham, then I purchased a ticket from Birmingham to Montgomery. And not long after I purchased the ticket, and I remember the bus arrived, about the bus arriving in uh, uh, Anniston, Alabama, and was blown up in Anniston. Yeah. And then they came on to Birmingham. But you know, as that, during that time, they had two bus stations. They had Trailway and they had Greyhound. And Trailway um, was one that I was not that familiar with. I was more familiar with the Greyhound bus station. And I found out later on why I was, uh, I thought about later on why I was in uh, really uh, more attracted to the Greyhound bus station. My grandfather, my daddy's father, uh, 
Uh, when he got older, he couldn't go anywhere by himself because he'd get lost. Well, some of us had to be with him. He was always going to the Greyhound bus station. <laughs> but anyway, uh, <clears throat> this is where I, you know, I kind of uh, wanted to be. So I went and got my ticket and everything. So when they got to Birmingham, and uh, I went down to the Greyhound bus station along with a young lady at that time that lived in the projects when I was a little girl. Her name was... Um, um, Candace Grimes? Candace. Candace. Now, Candace <laughs> um, told me that her uncle was uh, Reverend Abernathy, but I didn't know this. You know, who Reverend Abernathy was, it really wasn't that important. Is you know, <laughs> to me, Abernathy, okay. <laughs> but we had decided to go down to the Greyhound bus station to take a look. But um, what happened is it was roped off. Then um, I wanted to go. I went down there, I think, the next night after, and I talked. I met a guy by the name of Wilson Brown. And Wilson... I think was some kind of a part of a welcoming committee or something there in Birmingham for the Freedom Riders when they got in. And I told him I wanted to go. And Wilson said, okay. He said, but uh, he started talking to me about nonviolence and I didn't understand nonviolence. But when I bought the ticket, I had bought me a knife to go with the ticket because I'm going to protect myself on the bus. And um, Wilson told me I couldn't go because I didn't understand the concept of nonviolence. And I asked him what did nonviolence mean. He said, this is when someone hits you, you can't hit them back. I said, I don't think I'm going to do that. So I got a refund for my ticket. And later on, I was seeing Wilson every, every night or every other night coming into the, the uh, AJ Gaston Lounge. Uh, which was a special spot for uh, my uh, my friends and myself, my other girlfriends and myself. And um, <clears throat> one night Wilson asked me, not long after that, uh, did I want to go to a student nonviolent coordinating committee meeting in Atlanta? Well, the thought was, I said, oh, I've never been to Atlanta before. <laughs> And now I'm going to get a chance to go free. And plus, I wanted to learn more about what was going on in the civil rights movement. And I told him, yes. I left my knife at home. <laughs> and everything is history after that. Um, that was your first big move towards direct involvement with SNCC. Yeah, that was the first, first big movement towards getting involved in the, move, in, in the civil rights movement. Yeah. I can, came can to the meeting. Can we there for a minute? Before we tell the Atlanta story, I want to ask a couple things. Um, I have a note um, from the research that I did in preparing for this session that in the late 50s you had become um, quite interested and, and considered joining and perhaps um, did become a member of the Nation of Islam. Well, what happened is um, I made my first uh, contact with people in the Nation of Islam when Max Parker was in jail before he was murdered. And they, were the, they had the, the Muhammad speaks, and this was the only paper that had, that had something meaningful about this man every day in the paper, even up to the time he was murdered and even after he was murdered. And this is what attracted me to them because this was something visible that I had saw going on. Well, I saw something going on, I should say. And I started going to some of the meetings. And uh, the thing about this was that um, they weren't visible enough for me. You know, m maybe it just wasn't enough activity, uh, which um, I'm not saying that what they were doing wasn't important, but it just, it just wasn't enough activity going on around it for me. 
uh, I, I guess I wanted more action, and I saw more direct action with uh, this, the civil, the, the sit-ins and, and the freedom rides, although I know CORE was a part, more part of uh, some of the, um, fr the freedom rides itself. And, but the, the, the thing about, about this is they, they just, they, so, so I went with what, what was more, more active, visibly active, then, uh, Can I ask you on the, on the, just before you're about to head for that SNCC meeting in Atlanta, what was your life like in Birmingham? What can you describe the community, the the things that um, were taking up your time, the what you were witnessing in the community? Well, I was riding the back of the bus, and I don't know, maybe maybe this thing of living in Pittsburgh, uh, and living under different conditions might have made made the difference because uh, when I went to Pittsburgh and we got to um, Cincinnati, I think, and my aunt told me I could sit anywhere I wanted to sit. But I still, they still didn't dawn on me because you have to remember I'm only nine or 10 years old and sitting anywhere I wanted to sit, it really didn't, although in Birmingham, when I got on the bus, I saw the sign saying color. But it still wasn't, you know, didn't, wasn't as meaningful. But then once I got to Pittsburgh and associating with the other children is really where I learned a lot of stuff because they were saying, don't say yes, sir, and no, sir, it's yes and no. And they would tell me about how to, I'd go to the store and ask for a drink. A orange drink, and they said, "Don't ask for a drink. You ask for a pop." And I just found out just about four weeks ago <laughs> why they call it a pop. The, you know what 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 started them to calling these things a pop. But anyway, <laughs> I uh, I changed a lot there, and I guess the coming back to Birmingham and then going back to ride in the back of the bus. And I went to an integrated school now in Pittsburgh. And it was different. It wasn't perfect, but it was different. And um, this, I guess this is what, what motivated me to probably um, get involved. Tell me, about the, tell me about the trip to Atlanta. Well, the, the, the trip to Atlanta, when I got to Atlanta um, and I met people, uh, met, met people there um, that eventually um, I became friends with and affected my whole life, and especially in terms of the idea of meeting some decent white people because I'd never met any decent white people to know them until I got to that meeting. I met uh, Ann and Carl Brayton. I met uh, Bob Zellner. I met Dolly Miller, who became Do uh, Dottie Zellner later on. I met Penny Patch. I met Bill Hansen. And there was a lot of other people I met um, in, uh, and even the blacks that I met, I met Miss Ella Baker, I met Jim Foreman, I met Ruby Doris, um, I met Julian Bond, I met so many, so many people um, that I, I hadn't, hadn't ever met before. And I, I guess you can say I went into it uh, from, a learning to, uh, from a learning stage uh, and I never knew anything I did was going to be important. <laughs> <laughs> so that was an annual meeting that lasted, what, a couple of days? Uh, this went on, I think, for a, 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 yeah, a couple of days, a weekend or something like that, mm -hmm. because at that time, SNCC had their first, their first office was on um, Auburn Avenue, upstairs over the uh, Atlanta World, where the Atlanta World was on Auburn Avenue, uh, and it had holes in the floor. You know, we had to be careful 
<laughs> we went upstairs, but we had to be careful about where we walked, you know, because the big hole in the floor, they were doing construction or something on the building. It was, you know. And then we went, it went from there to Raymond Street. But um, anyway, after that Atlanta meeting, um, matter of fact, on the way back home, we got in trouble <laughs> and almost got uh, murdered right there in Marietta, Georgia. What happened? Well, what we did is we, we got confused trying to get back to Birmingham. Wilson Brown, uh, Nathaniel Lee, and uh, there was a white girl that wanted to meet Reverend Shuttlesworth. Do you remember who that was? No, I never, because no, no. I never saw her again. Uh, she wanted to meet Reverend Shuttlesworth and myself. That's what we, we, we were all in the car together. And she'd been at the SNCC meeting too? She had been at the SNCC meeting too. Yeah. And we got confused and ended up in Marietta, Georgia. And we said, well, let's go in the bus station <laughs> and get some information. Well, we went in the bus station. And now we're in trouble because we go in the bus station and these people see this white girl with us. Um, and during that time, if you were uh, in a mixed group together, you were considered part of the civil rights movement, which I didn't know at the time and hadn't really thought about it at that point. But this is what the situation was when we left the bus station the police followed us. And when the police followed, we still don't know where we're going. And we couldn't find any black people <laughs> to ask. We didn't see any black people. And we got stopped. Uh, we hadn't done anything, but we got stopped. Police pulled us over. And by being Mary of Georgia, I'm saying it was just like you go two blocks and you're out, <laughs> out of the city limits. <laughs> or you headed out in, into the other area there, and, and what happened is the police stopped us, arrested Wilson, commandeered the car, and now we don't have no way to get around, and Wilson's in jail. And we were standing out on the street trying to figure out what to do, we try to find a black community, no black folk. And I said, let's go back to the bus station. Because <laughs> we could still see the bus station right there. Once we got back into the city, they made Wilson drive his car with us in it, put us out, take Wilson to jail, take the car. And there we are. And we decided to go to the bus station finally. And when we got to the bus station, the attendant told us we couldn't stay because we weren't customers. I said, uh, I thought about it, I said, let's buy tickets. <laughs> and, you know, back to it, we couldn't buy tickets too far, back to Atlanta, anything. But this made us, because I understood the part about the, uh, what was it, the Interstate Chamber of Commerce, the law is that they had to you know, once we became customers, since they said we weren't customers, okay, we'll become customers. So you still would travel freely. Yeah, and that way they couldn't kick us out of the bus station. And we stayed in the bus station there, and uh, what we did is right after that, we called, called uh, back to the SNCC office and um, talked to someone there, uh, I think, uh, you know, I don't know who we talked to now, I forgot now. But anyway, we talked to someone. But during that time, if you remember, they had switchboards. You couldn't dial directly out, they had a switchboard. And we were using pay phones in the, um, in the bus station. And finally, um, but this was a way to communicate, at least let folk know where we were. And by this time, it's about dark dark, just got dark, and it was really, really frightening. Um, it wasn't too frightening at first. It was kind of um, uh, like 
kind of odd, but not too frightening until it got darker and we got crowd, crowd, people crowded the bus, only white people. More and more were coming to the bus station. More and more people. That bus station probably hadn't had that many people in it in the history of Marietta's <laughs> bus station, but it, it, it had a lot of people at night. So and uh, you, Nathaniel Lee, and, um, and one, uh, one white girl. And we start getting phone calls. Well, we first started to figure out where we were going to take a refuge. We didn't know where. We, it was three phone booths there. We decided we were going to take a phone booth apiece if things got worse. Tell me a little bit more what you mean by that. Well, during that time, they had phone booths. Sure. You know, when you used the phone, they had a booth. Yep. That the door would close on it. So you were thinking each to get inside of one of them and close the door? Yeah, we got three, three, three booths. We all got a booth. <laughs> This was going to be our refuge. But in the meantime, we were getting calls. Let's pause for just a moment, okay? So we're cooking. Um, we're back on after a short break to meet Ms. Saunders. Um, so you were just getting into Ms. No, Ms. Avery, you were, you were just... Um, well, I was just getting into the part about the, about the, uh, the switchboard. You know, they had um, switchboards then. Yes. And in order to get a call out, you had to go through a switchboard. And not long after we made the call, obviously um, they must have, have, uh, must have called the Associated Press. Because at that time, I think Julian was, uh, Julian Bond was, uh, was on the staff of the Atlanta uh, Inquirer. Uh, is it the Atlanta Inquirer? Okay. Anyway, he was on the staff of some little small black uh, black newspaper, and what he did, what they did was, um, the Associated Press started calling us, Back ask, on, the on the pay phone. They started calling us, asking us where we okay. Uh, every few minutes they'd call back and ask where we okay. Uh, but the thing about this, it, this is, uh, I don't think nobody could have gotten to us. If it, they really, and I think if we had stayed there longer than we did, it just so happened um, we were there until probably about 12 or 1 o'clock that night. But the later it got, the worse these people got, and the more hostile they became. They got sticks and started beating on the uh, seats and, 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 shouting all kind of obscenities and threats that they were going to kill us uh, and calling the white girl a nigger lover and this kind of this kind of stuff and we're going to kill y'all niggas tonight and uh, the later it got the more frightening it got and finally uh, Julian Bond and some other people showed up um, I think Howard Moore was one of the people uh, he was uh, one of the SNCC lawyers, and he finally married uh, Julian's sister, Jane. But um, Jim Foreman, Julian, Howard Moore, and a few other people came along, I think with some people from the Justice Department, to get Wilson out of jail and get us out of there. And Foreman decided we shouldn't... Uh, we shouldn't try to go to Birmingham that night, stay in Atlanta, and then go to Birmingham during the day. How'd they, how'd they deal with the crowd when they got there? How did they find their way in to get you and extract you from being surrounded by that crowd in the, in the Well, we don't, really, we don't really know, except uh, they came in and told us, we could, you know, to let's go. You know, after they got Wilson out of jail, they came to where, because the town is, <laughs> the jail is on the corner. Greyhound bus station probably, at, at, you know, when I can visualize it now, just probably across, across the street. Because we could see the Greyhound bus station from the jail house on the corner. And um, it wasn't that, that far. Did they come back with any local sheriff or police officer to manage no. the crowd? No, 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 no never happened. So they just on their own authority, they came they, you, yeah. Well, the people who came yeah. came from Atlanta. Yeah. They didn't come from, right. from Marietta. These were people who uh, 
came in from Atlanta, and I think it was part of the Justice Department, a member of something from the Justice Department. So they had somebody from the Justice Department? I think so. so they had a black, them black cars, and you know, yeah. the government cars. Okay. They had all the gotcha. black, and the, uh, but I'm assuming it was uh, some. Was anyway, somebody from the Justice yeah. Department that came there to uh, who assist was, us. Who and was white, obviously. That, hmm? that person was white, obviously. The Justice Department. Person. I I think so. Um, it's it's a lot of stuff that's kind of vague in there, uh, except for <laughs> the part in the bus station. Yeah. Must have been. Tell me about tell me about the you know what what the impact on on you was of being in such a, a, a very fearful situation. Well, um, I I I knew that it was very very good chances of us getting really hurt or killed there, but on the other hand. I learned to keep be calm and use my head when I'm in a situation. And that's in any situation. I apply that today because going to that bus station was the best thing we could do instead of trying to look for a black community. We don't know where the black community is. We didn't see any black people. The bus station, we could see that. Then when they told us we couldn't stay and we had, you know, when it came to me quick, to get the tickets. Let's get the tickets. We got the tickets. We weren't out of harm's way, but we were in a situation, and I'd rather been there than out on the road somewhere when it got dark. It's a good thing they did stop us before it got dark, you see, because stopping us out on the road with no communication, nobody around at all, even if they were bad people, it's better to have some people around but anyway, um, it was just uh, uh, something I learned, learned early on in terms of some of the things that I did later on that probably saved my life. Uh, now, when we finally got to Birmingham, we met Reverend Shuttlesworth. And this was my first time meeting Reverend Shuttlesworth. <laughs> right? Had he heard about what had happened in Marietta? Uh, no. Uh, Wilson called him and told him he had somebody <laughs> wanted to meet him, <laughs> and we we went to uh, went to his place and he was still in his pajamas when we met him, and this was my first time meeting meeting him being right there in Birmingham with all this activity going on. This was the very first time I met Reverend Shuttlesworth, um, and and not long thereafter, I think you you participated in sit-in at the Woolworths. If we you participated in a sit-in at the Woolworths. Yeah, yeah, he had me down at the Woolworths with it because we we were gonna test the sit-ins there, um, and we went to I think it was the Woolworths or the Cresses or one of them places. I think it was Woolworths, and uh, when we went in there. And Wilson and Reverend uh, Shuttlesworth and Reverend Billups were standing on the side. And the group of, I guess this was, a, I think this was the very first sit-in that Birmingham had. And we were going to test the sit-in. Well, they didn't, serve, they didn't arrest us, but they didn't serve us. But what, they would, they, what happened is they had a, a white fellow that was going down the counter spitting and pouring ketchup. And I hadn't quite been adjusted to this nonviolent thing. I wasn't sure how I was going to react to this spitting and being, you know, uh, and pouring ketchup. And Reverend Shuttlesworth <laughs> saw how I was acting, and I was, you know, and he said, come here. <laughs> I want you to stand here beside me. Because I hadn't really uh, learned much about the... Um, Nonviolence uh, thing to really want to want to use it as a tactic or anything. I had learned enough about it to to accept it for any reason. But I wanted to go sit on the lunch counter, and uh, I told Reverend Sir, I said I want to go back up there. He said you can't go. He had to stand right here with me. But anyway, uh, later on, 
I went to, I think it was Albany, Georgia. I don't know whether I had went there then or either had, anyway, I got arrested in Albany, Georgia. And uh, I think we had an attorney then by the name of C.B. King. Yep. And um, uh, there were some other people I met. The first people I met were, uh, Ruth, I met Ruth Harris. I met, uh, I think, uh, Bernice. Uh, Reagan. Reagan, and I met uh, Charles Sherrod, I think there. Yeah. I had already met him up at the, and I met Bob Mance. Bob Mance. Bob Mance. And Prathia Hall. And I'm trying to think of some other people that I met, met there. Can you, while you're thinking of these names, can you tell me a little bit about your impression of these people, these other folks like yourself who are making up <clears throat> SNCC in these days and what they were like and what you liked about them, what you maybe didn't like about them, what, what attracted you to them? Well, what attracted me was, is mostly just, I, you know, I've met these people and they were already involved. So I was like uh, in a learning stage, I th I considered myself being in a learning stage at all the time. It was something I could learn from them, and um, uh, participate. But mostly, it was an educational thing for me, because uh, some of these people even had higher educations than education than I did. Uh, but I was getting educated too, just being there with them and just talking with them and exchanging ideas, either just ask them. I, I said very little during that time. Did you feel, um, when you were getting involved in, in, in the protests directly, did you feel, I wonder how, what, what the emotional experience of going through a protest with a lot of hostility around you is, was like for you? Did you feel a lot of anger? Did you feel a lot of fear? Did you feel a lot of calm? What was the mix of emotions for you in a, in a situation like that? Well, the thing about anger, I had been in, been in a, uh, this environment so long, I'm saying, you know, I didn't walk around being angry all the time. Um, it might have been emotional. Um, uh, either just one to, to, to achieve something and do and want things to be better, basically. Uh, uh, because, I guess because I had been exposed to a different situation. Uh, you know, they say if a slave been a slave, they won't be slave no more. <laughs> if you've been free, you don't want to be slave anymore. So I guess that, that psychologically, that might have, uh, uh, in my subconscious, probably had a lot to do with it. I can't say which, uh, which, uh, which one thing or a combination of things I really can't can't uh, say except I can just probably uh, pinpoint some things and say that this this probably was what what happened and I'm just realizing that in the last few few uh, months or few uh, years that these are the kind of things that that probably prompt me to do what I did when you moved down to Albany, was your status, what was your status with SNCC? Were you a volunteer or were you getting paid? No, I was a volunteer. I don't think anybody was getting paid at that time. But they finally, uh, somehow or another, because this thing was probably too good to be true. <laughs> the, I guess the government and everybody else figures too, uh, this was a way to, to also um, um, disqualify SNCC, but and and you know the younger groups because where can you get people who want to go to jail take a risk on their life and don't get paid we were going to people's houses um staying with them and helping do the housework and stuff like this and then do voter registration too and do uh or do the demonstrations or whatever was going on there of to support the community. So it's kind of 
<laughs> it's kind of strange that they asked. I think we were getting, they finally forced them into giving us $10 a week, I think it was. Which is still nothing, but it was just a way to uh, probably make, uh, make us use our funds. Um, what, uh, what, do you, what, what, what are some of the things that come first to mind when you think about having, going down to Albany that first time? Charles Sherrod and the other folks are down there, and um, they put the Albany um, movement together. Well, I wanted to find out, um, well, the, the Georgia, I think they were around, I think uh, Bob Mance was in, in America, as I believe. But what happened is, um, I was just there to assist in whatever they wanted me to do, pretty much. That's basically where, where, what I did during that time. And tell, can, can you tell me in more detail what, how you spent your time, what it was like to go out to do voter registration, what it was like? Well, I did. I think I tried to do voter registration one day, and the next day I went on a demonstration, uh, uh, and I got locked up, that, uh, and I was in there for, I don't know, it was quite some time. I was about three or four weeks, I guess. Tell me, tell me about, if you would, what it was like to be in jail? What's the whole experience like of being in jail at that time in that kind of place? Well, um, I was in there for something uh, good and important, I thought. But what happened is I really... Uh, just in order to to adapt to this situation, I just uh, uh, really kind of put put out put in the back of my mind what was going on outside, and tried to adapt to the uh, environment around me. Um, I was able to get uh, six packages of cigarettes and stuff like this. Um, Anything that I could read or something, it was that's how I adjusted. I just immediately adapted, uh, and I guess that's probably one of the things um, that I've been good at is adapting to my environment at all times, whether I'm in jail or out of jail. I adapt to my environment. Uh. Let me ask about. Let me ask about the episode experience you had when um, after um, after uh, William Moore, who was a white postal carrier, actually was yeah. doing a march and um, was killed near Gadsden. Gadsden, Alabama. Yeah, and um, there was some uncertainty about whether or not SNCC would how they would respond, and, and you made a choice about how to respond. Can you can you talk about that? Later? Yeah, well, they had they they would they 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 hadn't decided on what they were going to do. And my position was to go do what William Moore was doing, to finish what he started, uh, even if I had to finish it alone. And I didn't realize when I decided to make a decision to do this that I was really actually taking on the march the way he did it alone. Um, I just didn't realize it. I just figured that we needed to go ahead and march. And my intention was to go with other people, but I didn't know how long it was going to be before, or either whether they were going to go at all, because it was so much, uh, it was a dilemma and so much discussion about it. And I made the decision to get me a sign and go on the William Moore March. Um, I was arrested uh, a few minutes later after I started walking with the sign. And placed in jail in Gaston, Alabama, where um, a day, the next day or two, some other people were arrested, and the, the females that I know were arrested were um, Diane Nash, believe it or not, Madeline Sherwood, who was one of the movie stars. Uh, she came down, and she was arrested. Uh, in the in the William of March, uh, she played in what is the Cat on the Hot Tin Roof. 
she played the the, the pregnant woman on the hot tin roof, and um, she came down and she bonded out right away. Uh, she was the only white female in the group, I think, and uh, she was bonded out right away. But Diane and two other young ladies from Birmingham were locked up, and they put them in a cell, I think, next to me. But before that, they were trying to interrogate me and try to find out how I got there, who brought me, and I didn't give them any information. I told them, y'all just my will take me on into the cell and put me in the jail or do whatever y'all gonna do because I ain't talking. I never did tell them how I got there, who brought me, <laughs> or what the details, no details at all. And later on, we were moved to uh, Wetumpka Prison after we'd been in there. So I think we were in there for about 10 weeks. We were in there quite a while together for that. Uh, I can't be exact. You know, uh, but we were in, uh, they moved us to Wetumpka uh, because it was supposedly a threat to come into jail and take us out and, and, to, and do us in. So uh, they took the boat, the young men who marched, they took them to Kilby and took us to uh, Wetumpka. And when we got to Wetumpka, they put us in a hole. Uh, the first night we stayed in a hole. Then the, they put us in the hospital with the people in the hospital, although we weren't sick. But I guess they decided that this is the best place for to be, us to be so we wouldn't stir up any trouble in jail. You just said a moment ago they put you in the hole? It was a hole. We what had you, to what crawl. Do you mean by that? It was a uh, it was a cell. It was dark. And it was a hole like because we really couldn't stand up in there. It was dark. The only thing I remember, it was dark in there. And we couldn't maneuver around. I guess they had us in there for, in that particular area for a reason uh, that night. But then the next morning is when they moved us to, to the hospital part of the jail. And one of the women who were bringing around the trays, it was a trustee, she was bringing the trays for the for the sick people <laughs> in the in the hospital, and she asked us. She said, "Where y'all from?" I said, "We knew they all we knew the freedom freedom fighters were here, and they didn't want us to know, but we knew about it. Everybody know. That's what the lady said. She said everybody know. So she asked us where were we from, and she asked Diane. Diane said Nashville. The other two girls said Birmingham. I said Birmingham." And I asked her, where was she from? She said, Tuscaloosa. And she said she was in there for life. Uh, some guy she, she was with. Uh, you, mentioned, uh, <clears throat> you mentioned a moment ago that after, um, you know, after Moore was killed, that there was a lot of discussion as to what to do. And mm. you made a decision to go forward with Moore. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier, too, that, that um, you know, when you first encountered these arguments about nonviolence as a strategy in the movement, you were, you know, had some skepticism about that in some way. Can you, can you explain a little bit about how your perspectives, how your opinions and viewpoints compared to the ones that you saw in SNCC in these years? Did you feel sometimes that there was some difference between your instincts about how to do things and what SNCC was, was doing? Well, I can only, uh, speak to individuals because there were certain individuals who took this on as a way of life. I was just one of those people among others who did not adopt nonviolence as a way of life, only as a tactic. Okay, we're back. Okay, we're back after a short break. Miss um, Avery, uh, we'll build the story towards uh, all the way up through and beyond Selma, but I want to ask now, 60, say 62, 63, um, you, had a, you, you went to a number of different places for SNCC. You had lots of different places. Yeah. Can you sketch that out and talk about what you did and what you saw and how, how you felt? And what Those were very busy, busy years for SNCC, and you were right in the middle of that. Well, um, cause what, what happened is I was there in Birmingham, too, 
um, had been a, one of the first on our, one of our first demonstration and was arrested. And we called it a decoy march because what we did is um, Reverend uh, Y.T. Walker uh, had me to go on a decoy march. And it was only about uh, maybe 10 or 15 people. And this was to throw, throw, the, throw the, the police off because what they were doing is if you marched once that day, they didn't expect any more marches. But little did they know that the bigger march was coming later. And one of my best friends, uh, I was talking to her. I said, you, she said, you going? I said, yes, I'm going. And she said, I ain't going. But on the second march, she came along. <laughs> And I guess she did because there was so many other people uh, who wanted, who, who she was the only one gonna be left out, cause uh, they arrested um, the other other people and myself. And then later on, they show up, and I said, "What you doing here, Betty?" <laughs> she said, "I, I said, but." You said you didn't want to go. You wasn't going. She said, I wasn't going to be out there by myself. So I guess when uh, several other people who were our associates or friends had decided they were going to go, and she just decided she wasn't going to be, be alone, she decided to go too. So. Uh, yeah. You were in Danville for a while. Yes, I was in Danville, Virginia. Um, I was uh, arrested several times in Danville, uh, but I was arrested there and put in solitary confinement. I had a 90-day sentence for contempt of court uh, in Danville. What, what, what was it that the judge found you in contempt for? Well, we, we came to court. My, uh, Matthew Jones, who just passed, uh, recently, and was um, one of the free, one of the freedom singers. Matthew, um, along with Avon Rollins, in Danville, we were, we were, they were working in Danville again. And I think it was some other guy there from finally came in from SCLC, and I can't think of what his name was. Uh, I might think of it in a minute, but anyway. Uh, we'd gone to court on some cases. You know, we had several cases already pending uh, from jail. And when we got there, and it was crowded inside the jail, inside the um, the courthouse, and out in the hall, uh, Matthew and I just showed up and we looked in there and looked down. Um, and the trial, the court case, court had already started, and the judge was sleep, sleep, literally sleep. He was nodding. And I said, Matthew, <laughs> see this? He sleep. <laughs> I, I said to Matthew, let's wake him up. So what we did is we went down to the front of the podium where he was sleep and went limp, just laid down on the floor. So he woke up, and he asked the police officer standing on the side, he said, what's wrong with him? And the police officer said, your honor, that's what they call going limp. And he was mad, he, said, <laughs> he gave us 90 days, he wouldn't take it back, so we had to serve our 90 days in solitary confinement. Uh, and when I got out of jail for that particular incident, um, Avon Rollins, who was project director at the time, told me to go home and take a break. Well, I go home to take a break. I get into Birmingham late, you know, Saturday evening, and I go to bed, and what awakened me the next morning was the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church. That's what awakened me. And I, uh, I lived about 16 blocks from there. Walked up to uh, 
that during that, that time on Sunday morning, the buses ran slow, so I was able to walk. Um, and it wasn't that far during that time. 16 blocks, is, 18 blocks was nothing to walk. So I walked uh, up to as close as the A.G. Gaston uh, Motel that had everything else roped off. And soon after that, Miss um, Ella Baker showed up. Dr. King came in. Uh, Reverend Abernathy. There was um, Jim Foreman, Andrew Young, and uh, and this was the first time I met Larry Larry Steele, who was a uh, editor of Jet at the time um, and things were kind of uh, kind of uh, kind of uh, we were you know emotional because of the children being murdered Absolutely. and later on that uh, that night we were in a room standing and sitting down and talking and this is where the uh, we were in that room uh, talking about uh, things to do, you know, cause, and we were, you know, pretty upset. We didn't know which way to go. Uh, we weren't sure about just we were, we weren't planning to do anything violent, but we wanted to take some kind of direct action that was more uh, more. Um, aggressive than than just marching and going to jail at that time um, then um i was in uh where was it uh let me ask while you're thinking about that let, let me ask you two other places that you worked you worked in hale county yeah and you worked in natchez i uh hale county uh, i was project director in hale county uh, on voter registration, and um, that was before I came here, but I was in Mississippi when Cheney, Swern, and Goodman were murdered. I was in Clarksdale, Mississippi, and I went from Clarksdale to Natchez, Mississippi. I was arrested in Natchez, Mississippi. Um, I c came here to uh, to organize a voter registration project, and there were several other friends of mine that came in. Uh, Cynthia Washington, I think, was up in Green County. She might have been in Perry County or Green County. I think it was Perry County, Green County, and you then. Uh, they were back on the We're back on it after a short break. You're talking about um, project director work in um, in Hale County. Mm -hmm. yeah, can you tell me what, what being a project director was like, all the things that you were, you were required to do and how you went about that work? Well, what, what we did is we first, um, when you first go into the community, we tried to uh, find a place to stay in the community. We let the community people know who we are and why we're there and find a place to live. Sometimes we found places to live, sometimes we didn't. Uh, because of the fear of the people, but um, we were able to rent a house there in uh, in Hale County. And when we first went through the community, we would uh, we met uh, some guy. Uh, I don't forgot his name. He was a, he was a sergeant in the army, and he said he wasn't going. He said he didn't believe in everything we believed in, and he said he didn't believe in <laughs> nonviolence. <laughs> So we still ask him to come to the mass meeting. But lo and behold, the first mass meeting we had, <clears throat> when the meeting was over, he was standing outside with his army rifle. <laughs> he said, I just wanted to be sure everything was going to be all right. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> and, uh, you know, sometimes I know they said, said that we had, but had guns, but the thing is, um, a lady by the name of Miss Johnny May, I forget her, in, in uh, Hale County said, said y'all have a weapon? We said, no. 
uh, the two people was working during during that time was St. Clair, Jetta, and myself. And he was the one who taught me how to drive. <clears throat> so if something happened to him, I could still drive the car. But anyway, they gave us a shotgun, a 10-gauge shotgun. And so every morning <clears throat> we got up, Sinclair was teaching me how to use this shotgun because his father taught him how to hunt. And just across the road from us, it was a dead end street we lived in, just across the road from us, there was a white family. I mean, they had a big fence up <laughs> around their house. But the funny thing about it is, us having that gun and him teaching me how to use it, actually, uh, probably helped save us a lot of time because they probably say, well, these people are supposed to be nonviolent, but they got a gun. <laughs> and that's what I call mind adjusting. You know, he got a gun, but they nonviolent. Yeah, but they got a gun. You know, we went to register the people to vote. We went to march at the courthouse and stuff like that. But these people got a gun. And, you know, uh, in my opinion, the the clan and all of these people who did all these evil things were cowards so uh, a coward <laughs> don't want to encounter nobody that really can equal up to them see so <clears throat> just the a f psychological effect that they got a gun and the only thing Sinclair was doing was out the back door it was a big a long field woods down in there. He just said, showing me how to hold a shotgun and, and how to use it. <laughs> Did there ever come a time where you, you picked up the gun thinking you'd have to use it? Um, no. Uh, we had some sort of the same situation in Natchez, Mississippi. Uh, Chico Neblet was the uh, project director there. And we didn't have a place to stay. We stayed in a lady's room. She had a room that she was renting. And she worked in a cafe at night. And we slept there because we didn't have anywhere to go. People wouldn't, let, wouldn't give us a place to stay. And Snick ended up buying a house there. I think the house was pretty cheap. I think they got it for about $3,000 or something like that, maybe less. You know, but we did have a place to stay there. But I came uh, here after uh, Natchez, Mississippi to work with at, on the voter registration. And then when Jim Lee Jackson was, had, had been killed here, um, there was a decision to, the original decision was to take his dead body to uh, Selma in a casket. And finally, it boiled down to us just marching. But now, <clears throat> the night before the march, um, we got a call. The reason Dr. King, because Dr. King was supposed to be here, but he was not here. Uh, we got a call. We were in a strategy meeting and sitting around talking. And a phone call came in directly from Attorney General uh, Kassenbach's office saying that Martin's life was in danger. And we took Martin away from here that night. And Jose Williams and Andrew Young flipped the coin on who was gonna represent SCLC on the march. That's how Jose Williams got that spot. That's the reason you see Jose Williams out there in the, in the, in the, in the park. Yeah. And you'll see John Lewis. And you'll see Miss Boynton and Miss Annie, uh, Miss uh, Marie Foster. And Marie Foster was, was one of the um, people who marched all the way on the last march. To go back, though, I got arrested here on Blood Sunday. But I was the only person that got arrested. See, the intent was, was to terrorize us and brutalize us and to strike fear and so much fear in us that we wouldn't want to march. Now, with all the police that they had, 
and where they had them, they had them at um, what uh, the police line was the, the traffic light, the first traffic light you get to after you go across the bridge. It was just about right along in that area. Let me, let me just mention too for the tape, we, we turned and looked over our shoulder out the, out the window. Miss Avery looked straight out the window. You can see that bridge. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, what happened is the, the, um, they had, had the road blocked off, and their intention was really to hurt us. Now, <clears throat> before we march, myself and some other people came out and uh, drove around, took a look, just to see what the situation was like. Scouting. Scouting, yeah. And we could see where they had, had it lined off. Not only that, um, the reason I got arrested was the police and I was having a physical disagreement about where I wanted to be and where he wanted me to be. Because after, um, I guess the tear gas, because I didn't get effects of the tear gas. I was arrested pretty, pretty quick when uh, the police and I had this uh, difference and taken on off to jail. But the intent was really to brutalize us because if if their intent was to to stop us uh, and arrest us, that was what they didn't arrest but me once. But most of the stuff that went on was beatings and tear gassing, and, and they even took pictures of it themselves. They took their own pictures of it. If you go to the museum now, and you'll see on the bottom where it says Alabama Department of Public Safety. Well, we didn't have any cameras anyway. We couldn't afford cameras. Because um, I've had people ask me, say, where's your picture? I said, there's no telling where I was. I said, we didn't take the pictures. And plus, I wasn't trying to stop on any, any demonstration I was on. I was just part, wanting to be part of it. So you marched um, on the 21st? Seventh. I marched on the seventh. That was all three. Well, we had three marches. Sure. And then on the ninth. Then on the ninth, and then on the final march. And then on the final march all the way but I didn't walk all the way to Montgomery. Yeah. What was your I role? rode. What was your role? Well, I was I was still um, still just project director um, <laughs> of Hill County. Sure. sure. <laughs> That's all I was. I, I had but, read that you had done. You had a lot of. Um, they often would ask you to help with security, like you mentioned going out scouting and, and trying to get a sense of what might be waiting in terms of police response. And mm -hmm. Is that a, or did you sometimes do some of that kind of work? Not often, because I didn't drive, you know. Okay. I just learned to drive. Okay. Uh, but I was sent on during a certain, uh, I had certain things to do. Uh, from time to time, I was just chosen out of, I, not maybe out of the clear blue, because the people knew who they were choosing to do. Because mm -hmm. right there in Birmingham, uh, the state patrol were looking for Dr. King to give him an injunction. And I had just gotten out of jail in Birmingham, and what they were trying to do is enjoin all the people who were march, or either they thought were going to march, like Dr. King, and I'm sitting in the lounge there with my friend Betty and some other people. But Dr. Walker, Dr. Y.T. Walker, uh, choose, chose me to do this. But I think that I was chosen to do it because Betty couldn't have kept it quiet, you know, <laughs> in hindsight. That's probably what it was. And he walked over to me and he whispered in my ear. He said, uh, go around to room such as, such, I forgot what the room was now, go around there and tell them that the police is out here looking for Dr. King. I said, Dr. King around there in the room, around there, he's around. They had him registered in the, in the master suite, but he didn't, wasn't staying in the master suite. He was uh, around there in the room with Andy and, uh, and Bernard Lee, who was one of his uh, lieutenants. And I discreetly and quietly got up and walked out, told my friends I'd be back in a minute. Walked out, went around, told, carried the message, come back and sit down. 
Um, that was part of the decor march and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did stuff like that from time to time. Especially since we're right here looking out the window at the bridge. What other memories come most uh, vividly to your mind when you think about those three marches on that bridge? Uh, Bloody Sunday, you know, um, what happened is after the march was over and I finally got out of jail, but you know something? This was the shortest time I'd ever stayed in jail was right here in Selma. <laughs> um, and why is that? Attorney Peter Hall barred me out out of his pocket. That's what happened. He came in from Birmingham. He was one of our attorneys. He came in and somebody, they had been looking for me and somebody told him that I was in jail. And he came to the jail, bonded me out, got in his car, went back to um, Birmingham. Matter of fact, he was back in Birmingham before I was released. They didn't release me right away. I don't know why they kept me there until 11, 12 o'clock at night because the march had been over and stuff like that. And I had been bonded out long before that, but they, wouldn't, they didn't release me until then. Maybe they thought I was going to get out there and join them again as soon as they let me out or something. I don't know. I can only assume, but um, I just stayed in jail a few hours, <laughs> and that was phenomenal compared to all the other times that I'd been to jail. And the longest time I spent in jail was in Danville, Virginia, and 90 days for contempt of court. Obama. Yes. Um, well, being the uh, first African American president, I never thought it would happen during my time. But if it did, I always thought his name would be Charles, Joe, John, Henry, Bob. I never thought he would have an African name. And that kind of excited me even more. And I, uh, I said, said to myself, uh, this is my personal thought, I said, it don't get no better than this. <laughs> and also that he was being elected on my 65th birthday. And you know, on your 65th birthday, that's a turning point in your life. And I said, oh boy, this is real good, <laughs> real good. That is a good yeah. birthday present, Yeah, I was really, ex really excited. Uh, not just about him being African American, but because he he has an African name, mm -hmm. which wasn't expected. I, at first, when he started, I said, "Oh no, <laughs> we're gonna have a problem." <laughs> and I just, you know, it was just uh, astounding just to just to think that it happened. You know. One is, you were relatively young when you first went to that Atlanta meeting. Yes. You were about 18 years old. No, I was 17, 16. As young as 16. 16. You were born in 43. Mm hmm. Okay. But I didn't, I turned, I was 16 turning 17 okay. in that November. Okay. So when I got arrested, I was 17. That very first meeting then would have been still in 1960. Mm hmm. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you're talking about the, the fair first meeting with SNCC people? Yeah, yeah. No, it would have been 61. Yeah, exactly. Okay, okay. So, um, I thought you said 60, but 61 okay. is... Um, so, but, but still, a fairly young person, about 18, 17, 18, and um, you will very quickly uh, be moving full-time into a lot of important roles with SNCC, and will emerge as a project director, I'm wondering about your feeling about about your roles inside SNCC and the roles of women inside SNCC and how you felt um, how you felt about how you were able to use your skills and your talents and your personality and all your efforts on the on, on behalf of SNCC's, SNCC's wider program. Well, I didn't think too much of it over the time. I was just being myself and. I wasn't trying to start, so I was just 
But uh, one thing I, I found out later on, I didn't know who Harriet Tubman was, but I found out that I was a modern day Harriet Tubman when it, when it come down to going to jail and the people would get in jail and it was the experience of um, sometimes people, some people would, maybe one individual would break down because the, the uh, psychological effect of closing that iron door had an effect on you if you didn't know how to adapt to that and take it and turn it in into something uh, of a, what you call a suffering for doing getting something better done or getting something done that was good. But what happened is <coughs> when people would come in and when somebody started that, I said, hey, no, we can't have that. Cause we have a problem in here. We're in jail. And what happened is the people who are jailers and stuff will take the advantage of this and try to do things to frighten us. And this is one of the reasons you don't want to do this because, you, you know, and then the other prisoners in jail will think that they can run over us. So the best thing we can do, if you feel like, you know, you want to cry, go in the closet, uh, go in the, uh, either call me, and talk to me, don't don't start that here. And then another thing, if one do it, uh, three or four others might do it and start demanding to get out of jail because they don't, I said, we're gonna get us some cards, and we're gonna get us some dominoes if we can. And sometimes we were able to do this. And sometimes we had money on us. It wasn't much money, but remember now you're in jail. And if you wanna get cigarettes and you got 50 cents, you can get a pack of cigarettes. Somebody get you a pack of cigarettes. Or, you know, things that, you know, if we were in a situation where, where you were allowed, because a lot of times we weren't allowed to have anything, point blank, nothing. But there were times when, you know, we were in jail, and there would be, uh, uh, they, when they come around, they didn't, discriminate on that, they come around and say, well, who wants cigarettes, who wants, or either if they wouldn't get us a book or anything like that, uh, we could get it, and even if we had, um, had a little money, we could get some information out, uh, you know, give somebody something and say, well, uh, call this number and tell them uh, uh, that such and such a thing is all right, uh, and things like this, and it was better to appear to be strong than to be weak. So that, that's, that's uh, pretty much uh, what I, but I didn't understand that I, I call it now being a modern day Harriet Tubman, but I didn't realize this at the time because I ne didn't know who Harriet was. Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask the last couple questions. One is, um, what was your opinion of um, folks in SCLC compared to the folks in SNCC? Did you have a, since you were so SNCC, your work was so much centered in SNCC, did you have a, Opinion about the SCLC? Well, SCLC uh, was uh, <coughs> um, had its place, and so did SNCC, and so did CORE, and so did NAACP. But the older people, the more mature people, wanted not to move so fast. And the young people wanted to move now. They didn't want to wait 20 years to come from the back of the bus. They didn't want to wait 20 years to sit at a lunch counter. And that's the reason, I, by me being young, I wanted to uh, be a part of, of what the young people were doing. And this, the, the difference between uh, SNCC and SCLC was that really SNCC and CORE uh, were like the infantry. Because we went into places where you couldn't walk the street. Forget about doing, I don't care what project, director, whatever you're trying to do, it ain't finna happen. They're gonna come, <laughs> they were arresting us just for being in town. If you walk the street, you got arrested. Uh, anytime they decided to pick us up and arrest us, that's what they did. Vagrancy. And we had to have uh, uh, we had to be careful not to get arrested for these kind of things if we could because um, 
we needed that funds to burn out for something else. But the um, getting arrested for vacancy, they said, okay, everybody had 50 cent on them or whatever. You know, you had, you had some money on it. Uh, which also worked to our advantage. If we did go to jail, you had 50 cent. And you could do something with 50, 50 cent, don't sound like much now, but you could do much more than you think, think you could now with it in jail. So, uh, did you have, did you have um, make certain friends or have certain allies inside SNCC who mattered most to you? Yeah. Who who were those people? Well, um, one of one of the one of the persons that I was really uh, um, I I consider Jim Jim Foreman and Ella Baker my mentors, but uh, people like my friends were especially people that I worked personally with and um, Janet Moses, um, Ruby Sales, uh, Gwen Patton, uh, Bob Manns, uh, you could say Julian, you know, the people that I, uh, I uh, uh, um, Ruby Dara Smith, Prathia Hall, um, Sam Block, uh, James Peacock, and Willie Peacock. James is dead now. Uh, though they both came, James Peacock, Willie Peacock, and Sam Block came from Mississippi. Uh, Frank Smith, who has a museum up in uh, Washington, a slavery and Civil War museum. Uh, Charles Sherrod, all of the people that I knew, Charles Jones, there's a whole lot of people that I knew, Dottie Zellner, Bob Zellner. Um, over a period of time, you know, you get to know people, you see them all the time, you work with them, uh, you get to uh, have a certain bond. Um, Constance Romley, uh, who's one of my best friends. Um, she came in from California to work. Um, she worked mostly out of the Atlanta office, but uh, Judy Richardson. Um, of course, Judy and I went to jail together. That, that's another thing. A lot of us who went to jail together uh, and spent time in jail together, you know, um, like <laughs> I didn't know much about Diane except for what I had heard. But... I'm saying we spend 10 weeks in jail. I'm saying you really, really, really going to get to know somebody in 10 weeks. Yeah. What impression, what, 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 how would you describe her? Um, I, I, I describe her as a, a strong black female. Um, probably, um, uh, she was much more forceful than some other people. Um, and by me wanting to be forceful myself and do it, and well, probably just wanting to see things go ahead, these are the people that I, that I uh, look, kind of looked up to. Um, and especially people in Mississippi, because in Mississippi, it was really a hard case. You know going to Mississippi. Um, matter of fact, one of the worst things, one of the most frightening times in my life in the Civil Rights Movement was in Mississippi and Clarksdale. Mm -hmm. The night that the Klan surrounded our office, they had a cl um, curfew on black people. Couldn't be on the street after um, 12 midnight. So 11.15, 11.30, you had to be headed home. And the Klan surrounded our office one night. We couldn't leave, and we didn't want to stay. Only thing we could, and we couldn't see the faces or anything. Only thing we could see was headlights. Now, we knew there weren't any black people out there doing this. It was white folks. <laughs> the headlights, and they were screaming and shouting all kind of obscenities. And this went on all night long. The only thing we had to guard us was under a desk or under a table or something. Mm. 
uh, Lafayette Cerny was the guy who was uh, head of the project then. After after sixty five, <clears throat> um, and after the Voting Rights Act passes in the summer of fifty five, and what what's your role with SNCC from sixty five forward? Well. We kind of thought everything, at least I did, uh, I guess you can say we dropped the ball. We thought things were going to get better, things were going to, you know, be all right. Because um, uh, when I finally went to New York and stayed, I think it was 67, um, I was around the, the New York SNCC office. You know, it was still SNCC. And, and, um, it's been SNCC all the time, only because, actually, uh, SCLC didn't put me on staff. That's one of the only reasons, too. Another thing is they weren't, they, they were uh, older and more mature. And just like I said, the, the, um, the infra, a, lot, a lot of the places that we went, a lot of places, Dr. King, just about all the places, uh, people like SCLC or SNCC Corps went, there was already a movement there when we got there. There was already a movement in a lot of these places. And NAACP was our legal, much, 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 uh, mostly our legal. We had a lawyer once, though, uh, Lynn Holt. I don't know where he is now, but Lynn was stayed in jail as much as we did for contempt of court with the judges. <laughs> We get in jail and we used to standing around and you see, well, Lynn, what you doing here, man? He said, I've been in here too. What you, we thought you were outside trying to get us out. <laughs> so you moved up to New York in 67. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I stayed there for a while, but then I came back to Atlanta. And um, when I, uh, I had a taxi cab service in Atlanta and I represented cab drivers there. I was organizing cab drivers. Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask you about one more thing. In 66, Stokely Carmichael obviously replaces John Lewis as the head of SNCC. And mm. The rhetoric shifts. There's more move towards um, the question of armed self-defense. There's more the black power rhetoric comes in. And folks talk about there's a little bit of a different spirit now. I think it was SNCC. radical. You know, it was it, we, uh, the, 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 that part came, became more uh, culture conscious too and uh, a lot of people didn't understand everything that was behind that it wasn't just uh, you know they heard the word black power and they thought about something else but that wasn't what it was about it was about uh, lifting ourselves up um, and pretty much I don't know of any any organization, any any black organization, uh, organization that was mixed like that that went on a violent march. They went on. A, uh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Excuse me. We need to take a little bit of a break. We're back on after after that interruption. Um, <coughs> Miss Haber, you, you were talking a little bit about your perspective on the the shift in, in SNCC after '66. Well, the thing about it is, I didn't. Uh, uh, we, you know, all of the black organizations or either or integrated organizations never did did a, a, a violent, we never, they never uh, did a violent demonstration or go after anybody. That's violence. Um, what we did in Hale County was self-defense. You know, there's a difference between self-defense and overt violence. And I don't know of any of that, any overt uh, activity. Um, mostly it was cultural and the trying to uh, defend ourselves. And younger group of people go do different things. They were, some of those folk were younger than us even. So. You know, uh, by cultural, you, you mean like uh, learning about Africa, black people? Yeah, Africa. yeah. I'm just saying, and, and then empowering yourself because if you don't think good of yourself, nobody's going to think good of you. You know, and this is when I began to learn more about African American history and African history. Cause uh, I got arrested in in Atlanta 
for trying to see a dig African dignitary. I finally got to see one here in Selma when uh, Winnie Mandela came here. Um, I was introduced to her by Rose Sanders, and I hugged her and I said, I'm so glad to meet you, I don't know what to do. You're the first African dignitary that I got to see without getting arrested. I really want to thank you, Ms. Avery. Any final thoughts? Uh, you've been so generous with your time. And well, um, what I, I do, do want to say is that at this time, I think it was an honor to have been associated with all of the people that I worked with, the SCLC people, the NAACP people, the core people, and now the uh, people who are working with the Bridge Cross and Jubilee and the National Voting Rights Museum and the Mississippi uh, Civil Rights Veterans. I'm, I'm just uh, excited and honored to have been associated with uh, uh, all of these people that I have met and known, Mary and Bear. Just, it's just a host of people. We can go on all day, but. Um, well, thank you. You've, you've given us a fabulous interview and we really appreciate your taking the time and sitting down with us. Thank you. Okay, I thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture.